Okay, if that's everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone so much for coming. Um, we have a great episode ahead of us. Um, to start out, we're going to go ahead and play a USCF video about licensed officials. Um, Nikki, can you allow me to share my screen? <laughs> How about now? We're all good. That's the whole why they wanted to say that Obamacare was we need Do we have sound for it Nikki um yep Kiana that's on you you got to click the button when you share when you ask to share screen on the bottom of your screen it'll say share sound it's on the bottom right right next to uh chat so no you have un unshare your screen okay now when i ask you which screen to share on the bottom it should say share sound with the screen did you find, find it you're on mute i can't hear you Sorry, I clicked it on before and I don't know why it didn't share the sound. I'll try it one more time. <laughs> 200 license officials that represent 5,000 licenses. And those license officials represent three major types. There are judges, course designers, and stewards and technical delegates. So judges are responsible for evaluating a horse or rider's performance in the competition area. Within all the breeds and disciplines of U.S. Equestrian, there are many different types of judges, such as breed judges, Andalusian Lusitano, all the way to Western Dressage, to Hunter judges. So there are many different types. A competition, you'll likely see a judge either in the middle of the ring or outside of the ring in a booth. For example, at a hunter competition, you might see a hunter judge walking the confirmation line. For some breed judges, you may see them standing in the center of the ring. Judges can attend continuing education clinics as part of the process to maintain their license. Depending on the breed and discipline, judges may attend clinics anywhere from every year to every five years. There are two different kinds of judges. There are subjective judges and objective judges. Subjective judges can usually be found in breed classes or hunter classes. For example, they're going to be looking for the quality of a horse, the type of movement it has, or a rider's position. A good example of an objective judge would be a jumper judge. For example, they are looking for poles that are knocked down and a foot that may step in the water. There are several different types of course designers. For example, there are jumper course designers, hunter course designers, eventing course designers, and driving course designers. Course designers are responsible for placing objects or jumps on a track that a horse or rider combination would be traveling on. Course designers also complete continuing education clinics, apprenticing, or exams for their application requirements. You will probably find a course designer at a competition getting ready in the morning for the following day's classes. So they'll be prepping the ring, placing jumps in the correct order and position. You may also find an eventing course designer traveling out to locations weeks in advance to prepare the cross country courses and where they are going to place obstacles. In order to become a jumper course designer, for example, you would have to meet a certain number of prerequisite requirements you would attend a jumper course design clinic, which can be anywhere from one to two days. You would complete apprenticing that would be at competitions with a large R jumper course designer. Those apprenticeships can be anywhere from seven to 14 days long. 
and then once all of those requirements are completed, then you would submit your application to U.S. Equestrian. Stewards and technical delegates are very important for U.S. Equestrian because they provide the observations and reporting that we aren't able to see while they are at the competition. When a steward is observing a warm-up area or schooling area, they may be looking out for competitors to ensure that they're jumping the schooling jumps in the correct direction. They also may be just looking for general safety so that everyone is in a safe environment. Another thing that a steward might be doing is measuring a pony. This is to ensure that the correct size pony are in competing in the correct sections. And this is to ensure that there's a level playing field for all. It's very important for competitors and managers to be familiar with U.S. Equestrian's rules. However, if someone were to have a question about a specific piece of equipment or how a class is run, stewards and TDs are available. Stewards and TDs are likely in various locations throughout a competition. So if you'd like to become familiar with whoever your steward or TD is, feel free to contact your show manager or management company. There are three different types of licensed officials. There are small R's, large R's, and S's. Depending on the breed and discipline, a license could offer one or all three different types. Most licenses start with a small R license, which is a recorded license, and that is where an applicant may start the process to become a licensed official. So that usually entails clinics, apprenticing, and learning the duties of that job. Some licenses offer a large R level, which is a registered license, and that usually entails someone with a little bit more experience. They have maintained a small R license for a certain number of years. They will often attend clinics and complete apprenticing requirements in order to apply for that new level. Some licenses offer a senior level, which is uh, often referred to as an S license and that is the top level of national licensure that U.S. Equestrian offers. And these are individuals that have spent a long time being an official usually, and for their application process, they also attend educational sessions, complete apprenticing, or complete any type of exam. The licensing process can vary a lot from discipline to discipline, from breed to breed. So in general, most applicants complete a continuing education clinic, a seminar, and then they usually go on to apprenticing and may also complete some type of an exam. Once the application is complete, it is reviewed by the License Officials Committee and the CEO at U.S. Equestrian. If your application is approved, then you receive a notice from the License Officials Department and you will have received your license. Your name gets added to the officials search on the U.S. Equestrian website and you are able to start officiating. U.S. Equestrian is always looking for new license officials. It's a great way to get involved in the sport and provides a different perspective for you. Okay, so now we will go right into our guest judge introducing her. So welcome, Karen. Thank you so much for doing this for us. Well, thank you for having me, Kiana. Appreciate yep. it. So we will go right into questions. Um, first of all, how did you get started with horses? How did I get started with horses? Well, I kind of was born into it, literally. Um, I came from a very small backyard family with horses. And, but my mother literally was very pregnant, cleaning stalls right before she had me. And she had to clean the stalls and take care of the horses before she went to the hospital. So I literally was born almost in the barn. <laughs> um, 
but no, I, I've been raised with horses my entire life. Um, and I had the opportunity over the years to work with many horse trainers um, in Morgans, Arabians, Hackney, Saddlebreds, National Show Horses, um, multiple breeds, multiple di disciplines, um, and had the opportunity to learn from each and every one of them. That's really cool. Um, Lucy, do you want to go next? Yeah. Um, what made you want to become a judge? Um, as a lot of the people that I worked with, um, they, most of them were actually judges at the time. Uh, so we would talk about it a lot. And then I got very involved in 4-H and started competing in 4-H judging contests and learning how to judge horse shows and all breeds, all disciplines. And, um, got into competitions, obviously. And I actually had a lot of um, good guidance, good training, um, stumbled away all, all the way through it from when I started, which I was very young, um, up until my last year in 4-H. And I can remember my first time I ever gave oral reasons, I think I had a high score of 14, which was not very good. <laughs> And the last time I did it, um, I had a score of 48 out of 50. So um, I actually learned quite a bit through the 4-H that guided me into uh, judging breed shows and things of that nature. I um, was the first youth uh, judging contest winner. Um, and for the Morgan Horse Association, I believe that was in 1973, maybe, um, at the Grand National, the first one in Detroit. And then um, uh, that same year, I won the New England uh, Morgan Horse Judging Contest, and I won the American Victorial Judging Contest, which you judge pictures of different breeds and had to place it. And so, um, that's pretty much how I started. I started judging 4-H and open shows long before I got into judging uh, breed shows. So that's how I got started. Um, what was the process like for you personally? I mean, the video kind of already outlined the general, but I mean, what kind of, how long did it take you to become a judge, like the official, um, and how many practice shows did you need to have, and who did you shadow? Well, when I started, we were allowed to start when I was 18, and today you have to be 21. Uh, so I started as soon as I could at 18, and I did a lot of learning judging. Um, I, I worked with a lot of different judges over the years uh, during that time period. Um, I probably did... Uh, well, I was going for several different breeds at the time. I was doing Morgans and Arabians at the time. So I would say I probably did four to six with the Morgans. Um, and they were large shows. They weren't small shows. Um, the only show I was not allowed to learn or judge um, was at the uh, New England Morgan Horse Show. But I actually ended up judging that over the years several times. So... Um, which is one of my favorite shows to do. Okay, that's great. Um, what or who was the best performance you've ever seen? That is a really hard question to answer because over a long period of time, I've seen some absolutely breathtaking performances. Um, and that's across all breeds. But I think one of the most memorable ones I had um, was at the Arabian Nationals in two, 2008. It was held at Tulsa in the what they call the pavilion. It's a very intimate ring. It was standing room only. It was a half hour of English pleasure class. It was the most electrifying moment that I ever judged. Uh, it still brings tears to my eyes. And that's what judging is. It's passion. Okay. Um, 
when um, we had that class come in, I mean, the music was rocking, the horses were rocking, the people were rocking. Um, and I was actually the call judge for it. And it was also the first time that the Arabians were allowed to use um, the work off a bill uh, of a class. You couldn't work off a class before that. And this had just come down. And our panel knew that this was an exciting class. We, we of course had qualifiers before. So by the time it came in, we suspected that there was a good chance for a work off in this class. And as you mature through learning how to judge with multiple teams or multiple people on a team, and also how to call classes and stuff like that, you realize that this was going to be a class with a work off. And we knew we could not judge this class really long and in like a regular class and then have a work off. So we were prepared for it. It went in there. It was so exhilarating and it was so loud in there. I actually had to write my class calls to my uh, ringmaster because there was so much motion going on and so many things going on that it, it just, it blew all our minds, including the exhibitors. They said, we were told that they uh, really enjoyed the moment. Even the ones who didn't make the work off enjoyed the moment. There were 16 horses in that ring. Um, and uh, there wasn't a bad horse in the class, but it was just that exciting. And when it, when a class, and there have been many classes over the years, but when a class brings that much um, passion and emotion, you know it was a great class. I love hearing um, how passionate you were about that. Um, do you have a favorite breed or division to judge? To be honest, any great horse doing a great job in any discipline is exciting to watch. Um, I love everything from a great Park Morgan to a great Western Morgan to, you know, in the Morgan breed to a great gated horse to a wonderful open jumper, Grand Prix level, um, a beautiful hunter, um, rainers, you name it. If they're, it's done well. And, oh, I'm so sorry. No worries. <laughs> I thought I'd turn this phone off. Sorry. Um, you know, a great horse is a great horse. You watch, a, I can get excited watching a foreign hand doing an obstacle class or, you know, it doesn't matter. When it takes your breath away, it's a great horse. So I love horses and um, just get, it's just exciting to watch a great horse. So tying into that a little bit, do you have a favorite breed or division to judge? Not really, because I love them all. Um, I think the important thing is, is to always remember your class rules, the class criteria, and um, uh, the standard of the discipline and the standard of the breed because I do so many different breeds as well. Um, do you have a favorite show to judge? One of my favorites is the Morgan Grand National. Mm -hmm. And I would say the Arabian Nationals. And there's so many wonderful horse shows. Um, but the Morgan Grand National is home to me. Right. How do you feel the Morgan breed has changed throughout the years you've been a judge? Um, I think, and I talk about this often, um, one of the biggest things that I've noticed over the years, has the horse changed that much or has the training, the conditioning, the um, great blacksmiths we have, the great vets we have, um, you know, training involves so much more than just, you know, riding and driving or whatever the case may be. 
there's so many other tools that we have to, um, to help facilitate the horse's abilities. And so one of the things that I've noticed over the years is because of the great uh, abilities of our trainers and the people who work our horses, um, the horse's physiques have improved so much through muscling and through nutrition and through everything. And um, the confirmation plays an important part on what the horse is capable of doing. But then what takes over after that is how we develop the horse's physique, the muscling and the conditioning of the performance that they're gonna be doing. So, um, and of course, mentally as well. I really like that perspective. Um, has your approach to judging changed at all over the years? Definitely has. Um, I think it, the longer you're judging, you have the opportunity to mature into it. Um, one of the things that um, I learned, I thought at the beginning I always placed a class, but as I have gone through time, I have learned you don't place the class. You are a recorder of the class. You observe the class. You watch the horses. You have to be a horseman. You have to be knowledgeable, of course, about everything regarding the horses, the rules, the criteria, et cetera. But you let the class happen in front of you. And as it, uh, the class proceeds through, then you realize, oh, I've got my class placing and it starts placing itself. And if you sit back and watch it, a good class is easy to place. It's the classes that then may not always have a winner, but um, you have to come up with a winner. And that, that is the one you will be working the hardest at. So you have to learn how to let it happen in front of you, but also learn how to judge the class as it's happening in front of you. So yes, it, I have changed over the years. What I like hasn't changed, but how you do it, the mechanics of it, yes. Okay, changing gears a little bit, what was winning Youth of the Year judging like? Well, when I won it, it wasn't actually called the Youth of the Year, it was the uh, judging contest, and it was strictly judging. and. And of course, over time, it changed and is now what it is today. But uh, when I won it, I was so excited um, because it was something I had worked hard for many years to learn how to do. And then it was a great stepping stone to move forward into the judging of, we called it learner judging with US, or it was American Horse Show Association then. Um, and so therefore, uh, it was a great opportunity to win it and a great stepping stone to move forward. Is there any particular um, lessons or things that you learned from those competitions that helped you directly um, as a professional judge? Uh, yes, um, it helps me to be, or uh, it helped me with, developing organizational skills, um, efficiency, judging mechanics, um, uh, decision-making, um, and quickly. Uh, it taught me how to read rules, um, understand criteria of the different classes. In other words, you can have an open class, a uh, ladies class, an amateur class, junior exhibitor class and how that same horse may not fit into all those classes. So, um, yeah, it, definitely. Okay, so this question is kind of two in one, but do you have licenses in the, any other associations besides USEF? Yes. And can your USEF license apply or do you need specific licenses in other, for, other, um, for other associations? Okay, I have 17 licenses in five different sanctioned organizations. 
So yes, and um, and I have to go through the training in all those organizations. They're all a little different. Um, so there's lots of training, uh, not just within USEF. And of course now USEF, uh, it, you're, you head towards the different breeds like the Morgans have their judging um, seminars, the Arabians, the saddle horses, uh, uh, the, I, well, let's see. I'll list them for you if I can remember them all. I have Andalusians, Arabians, uh, Frisians, Hackney Harness, um, Morgans, Saddlebreds, oh, Carriage Pleasure Driving, uh, Saddle Seat Equitation, and Western just from USEF. Oh, Roadster too. Um, and then um, I have uh, the Miniatures, the A's, which are the real little ones. And then I have um, from the American Driving Society, I have the uh, Carriage Pleasure Driving and Driven Dressage. And then I have the Pinto Horse Association license. And then I have Shetlands, American Show Ponies, and the R's, the um, American Miniature Horse Registry, the R's. And they're the bigger ones. So, um, yeah have to go through all that training, all that testing. <laughs> and you do have to re read all the rules all the time because Lonnie Lavery taught me many years ago. He said, you know, you got to read that rule book all the time because it's amazing what they sneak in there and what they sneak out. And it's true. Um, what do you notice first about a horse or rider pair when they come in the ring or when you're just judging a class? I like to see the partnership between them. Um, and uh, it's, that's probably the first thing I notice when they come through the gate is that partnership. And um, if it's, if I'm judging a horse class, I mainly focus in on the horse and only if they're, uh, I, well, I mainly focus in on the horse. So therefore I um, tend to watch action causes reaction. When I worked for Don, uh, with Don Burt a lot, and I don't know if anybody in this group really knows them, but there's a few more mature people on the other side that I know do. But Don taught me an awful lot about action causes reaction. And I do watch a lot of that. Um, and if I see something going on, I see that, okay, the reason that's happening is because that person is doing this, this, and this. And it could be good or bad. So that's what I'm watching is the action causes reaction. Okay, our next question is what tips, or sorry, there we go. What tips do you have for the judging portion of, for Youth of the Year competitors? Be prepared, know, know your subject matters, um, be confident, um, study a lot because there's a lot of different versions in the contest now. Um, practice, practice on your friends, practice on your enemies, you know, pra just practice in front of people. Um, and just be confident in, your, in yourself. Um, I remember in the judging part of it, when I did it, you know, you may not always agree with the official judge, but your oral reasons can carry you over. Because I, I mentioned that my oral reasons, my last year I did it. I actually placed the class poorly in it compared to the original or to the official judges. But they said that my oral reasons were so strong that they believed that they were wrong at the end of the day. So, I mean, just because you got did 
something different than somebody else doesn't mean that you can't support what you did. So, so be, um, be confident. It's probably the best thing at the end of the day. And branching off, Miss, do you have any advice for people who want to um, start their own career as a judge? Work with as many horse shows as you can, work with as many judges. And um, one of the things that I would highly recommend is that if you have the opportunity, even if you're at a horse show and not practicing, Go to the rail, watch the horses, and learn how to watch horses from the ground up back forward. A lot of people will watch the horses from the top down and miss what's going on below. And if the below part is working really well, the top part will probably work just as well. But sometimes you can fix a horse up on top, but have nothing below. Okay, we're shifting gears to more of a fun question. What is the funniest thing you've seen at a horse show? Oh my God. <laughs> funniest thing. Hmm. There's been a lot of them. Um, wow. Funniest, which one? Why? Well, I can I can uh, kind of talk about myself for that one. I think um, one of the funniest or most embarrassing, either one. Um, I had when this was early in my career. I had a really light powder blue pair of pants on one time, and I thought I was getting chewed up in the middle of the ring, and uh, I found out I had a grasshopper on me and it was pinching the heck out of me. And then it, of course they spit. And so they were leaving spots all over my pants. And it not, I not only did I have one up one leg and finally got it off, I went back in the ring and I had another one later on. And I had the same thing. So I had a lot of spots in my pants that day. Or I've had, let's see, I had a, my, I was wearing a pretty long dress, but it was light material. So I had a slip on and the band broke on the top <laughs> and kind of dropped to the ground. Um, I had a shoe where the sole came off right in the middle of the ring. And um, uh, I had to call the blacksmith and we had to tack it back together and tape it back together. <laughs> Um, do you want me to continue on? Things happen in the middle of the ring. <laughs> um, yes. See. Oh, yes. I stepped in a, uh, red ant pile one time. That didn't feel too good. Um, let's see. I mean, things happen as you can tell. There's not a perfect judging situation. And you just kind of got to go along with the situation and say, okay, you know, yeah, that happened, you know. Um, but one time when I was judging and we've all been spectators and we all sit there and we go, oh my God, what's that judge going to do with that mess? Well, I was, and it was Gold Cup, I remember, um, early in my career. And I was judging this amateur English pleasure class. And the walking trot was just fine. I called for the canner and I looked in one corner and it was disaster. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll go over and look in the other side. Looked in the next corner, it was disaster. Looked in the other corner, it was disaster. And I finally said, I can't judge anybody. So I went one, two, three, four, five, turn around, the whole class was working fine. I said, now I can judge. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to do what you have to do, you know, just to get things organized and just let it happen. But whatever I do, um, I try to let the audience know what I'm doing too. 
I want it to be transparent. So, I, you know, I do try to have fun with it, but then also realize there has to be a little bit of a serious side as well. Even when stuff happens to you, you still, yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, and then for our last question, also pretty fun. Um, you've judged in many countries. Has there been a favorite international country you visited? You know, each one I've visited has been an outstanding um, experience. Um, I think when you go overseas, um, you just make sure you understand how they like to have their horses judge number one um make sure you when i say that make sure you know their rules there because the rules aren't always the same and um i can remember judging in south africa one time and i had to do a judges seminar afterwards so i really had to bone up on their um rules and I, what i was doing was recertifying their judges uh it wasn't uh really something for new judges it was for existing and um one of the things that they had over there that was a little different than here was that they didn't declare horses lame it um they just were traveling different okay and then it was a, actually a regional arabian show and this stallion had been showing and he had a hawk on him, obviously had been injured at some point in its life. What I found out later was that the horse had kicked and hit a, a metal shaft and apparently it snapped. I don't know how that happened, but it snapped and went through his hawk. And so the more he showed, the lamer he got. Well, we had him also at the judges seminar and he was pretty sore by then and I had to really watch my verbiage not to call him lame. So I said something during this seminar and I said, in your country, this horse is not lame. And I would say that he has a gait deficit or his cadence is out of sequence, you know, something to that nature. It's not a diagnosis. And that's something you have to learn too when you're judging it. Unless you're a veterinarian, you can diagnose, but you can use all the symptoms just like a nurse would say, you know, um, his cadence is out of sequence, he had a gait deficit, he had a little catch in his get along, you know, something like that. All saying the same thing that the horse is lame. But this one lady, oh my, she came over my shoulder because, um, I had said that. She says, that horse is not lame. I said, I didn't say that horse was lame. And I never did use that word to, you know, to, as a diagnosis. And um, she was quite upset over the whole thing. And I said, no, she, the horse has a gait deficit. He, I mean, we can all see that, but that's all I'm saying. And so anyway, um, this lady went on and just really got quite upset. And then I had this professor who was also a judge, he came up to me and he said, Mrs. Brown, don't worry about her. She uh, has been trying to get her license back for the last three seminars. She gets a little upset every time and I go, oh, okay, <laughs> you know, but you do have to watch yourself when you go across the pond a little bit on knowing the rules, knowing what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, uh, things of that nature. But I have always, always enjoyed myself immensely. Um, the horses are magnificent. Um, they are shown differently. So don't have always expect it to be the same way in, as you have it here. Um, I did do Morgans in England a couple times and um, really enjoyed myself there. Uh, I, that was an interesting situation. I had um, a Morgan English pleasure class, three horses. I had one horse that was really a star at the walk and trot. And then when we asked him to canter, 
he never cantered one way. I mean, just didn't, not even a step. The other two did. They did all the uh, gates. They weren't the quality that he was, but they did do all the gates. And so I ended up using him third. And the lady was a little upset at me. She said, I've always won this class. I've always won this class. I said, did you canter before? She said, no. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. <laughs> so, you know, I said, well, you have to canter both ways of the ring. And it was in the rules. <laughs> and I said, you didn't canter one way. So you have to, when I say, you know, I, you asked me another question earlier, always have confidence, you know, just say what you see, nothing more, nothing less. Um, now we can open up the questions to the rest of the people on the call because um, the council has finished our set of questions. So does anybody else on the call have any questions? Um, I have one. How did you become involved with Morgans and Arabians? Well, I was raised with Morgans. Uh, my mother had a Morgan horse, so I naturally went into it. And then my mother's best friend had Arabians. And when I started um, in my equitation career, I showed Morgans and Arabians mostly and occasionally a saddle horse. Um, and uh, so that's pretty much how I got involved with them. Thank you. Does anybody have any other questions? I have a question. I was wondering, what do you look for in a Morgan Equitation writer for like 14 to 17 ish? What seat? What seat? Saddle, saddle seat, sorry. Saddle seat. I look for a writer that. Um, has has obviously good form, but also partners very well with their horse. Um, I want to see a saddle seat equitation rider that um, has presence and style, but has good skills in the, their riding. Um, and uh, has good ringmanship um and uh pretty much owns that ring thank you so we have in the chat do you have any advice for hunter walk trotters in the morgan division um what do you mostly judge on and what do you like to see in a pair and in the horse in both ek and pleasure for hunter seat equitation rider, I, I want to see that they have the proper hunter seat position for equitation um, and not just, you know, even in a walk trotter. Um, I also like to see um, the walk trotters not really in field boots. I see sometimes they're in field boots, sometimes they're not. Um, at that age, I really prefer them not being, but um, it's just more traditional. The other thing is I want to see their efficiency if, and their partnership with their horse. Um, and uh, again, the confidence that they, and that goes back to that partnership. Does anybody else have any other questions? In the chat, how do you feel about the new trends in hunter pleasure fashions, including coats? <laughs> oh, I'm a traditionalist. Um, I prefer tradition. Um, I'm not very big on the loud coats or anything like that. I, I'm one of those that always say, what do you want to show first? Do you want to show your horse or do you want to show your clothes? What do you want me to see first? And so I prefer a much more traditional look. Um, 
And I always say, you know, it's kind of like a lady wearing makeup. We always say we try to blend, blend, blend. And if you're not blending with your horse and it's so loud or so different, then um, it doesn't always help the horse. Now, if the horse is an outstanding performer, um, since there are no rules right now really against it in the pleasure classes, then I'm not going to take off for it, but it makes my job easier to judge you when I'm not having to work so hard to look at the horse. Okay, our next question in the chat is, what is the most stressful part of judging? Um, sometimes the scheduling of classes. Um, depending on the shows, sometimes you don't get much of a break and just that, just a couple minutes to break. Uh, I mean, there are some shows that I've done over the years that you just go from seven, eight o'clock in the morning to, oh, I can remember mm, a couple shows that I did when it was 2.20 in the morning the next morning and then had to be back at eight o'clock. So those are the types of shows when you just don't get rest, uh, enough breaks to um, just let you freshen up. And it doesn't have to be a long break. It can be 15, 20 minutes, but you know, you can end up just going all day long. But a lot of shows have gotten a lot better than that now. So, but that was probably the most stressful. What do you look for in a 11 and under walk trotter? 11 and under. Again, um, goes back to, you know, that horse's, horse and rider partnership. Are they suitable for one another? Uh, do, um, is, if it's an equitation class, are they riding that horse? Um, and I'm not talking about a high skilled ride, but I am talking about that ride that if it's a, a horse that's gamey, is the child gamey? Are they matching? Um, is the child timid? I wouldn't expect a gamey horse with a timid child, you know, those types of things. And that would also go back to the walk, uh, uh, the pleasure as well. Um, so I'm looking for obviously uh, in equitation, the skills, the form, and everything like that at that age. Also in pleasure, I'm looking for um, that suitability. Do they partner well enough on those transitions or the action of the child um, uh, matching the horse? You know, can, can they get through everything well? Okay, our next question in the chat is, do you have a favorite division, division to show in? For me to show in? Um, I have a horse right now, I'm really enjoying driving and I'm riding him too. So um, I'm coming back from a long hiatus and uh, I've just been having a blast. I don't, I don't care, I just enjoy my horse enough so the opportunity for me to show is just great i i don't care i really don't uh probably uh english pleasure my my division okay. In pleasure junior exhibitors um do you have a particular style of horse that you're drawn to the more unique um style or the uh, older traditional style of morgan for hunters I like fluidity. I like it to be ground covering. Um, I don't want short choppy gates. Um, the horse's confirmation is really going to dictate um, how he's going to carry its head. Um, do I mind a horse that carries its head up? No, but I don't want it, you know, jam back braced or anything like that. I want the horse to be able to engage from behind and carry itself forward. Um, 
So that would be probably what I'm looking for. A ground covering, again, can carry itself up, but still has to be able to drive forward. Okay, our next question is, what's <laughs> one moment in judging you'll never forget? Probably that instance I told you about the Arabian Nationals, that that was just electrifying. That's all I can say. I've never had an experience like that. I do know that even the city council of Tulsa came to us and said they had never seen that arena rock like that, including rock concerts. So that's how, that's how it really was. Um, there have been so many wonderful moments over the years. Um, I, yeah, God, you know, I've enjoyed watching people win and I can cry just as easily when they win and, and I can just sit back and enjoy the moment for them, you know, so. Okay. Um, do you have any suggestions in terms of someone trying to buy a horse for a walk trotter? What kind of confirmation or behavior you think is most ideal for a walk trotter? For a walk trotter, I think the important thing is, is that ability of that rider and horse to work together. Um, can that child uh, grow with that horse and can that horse grow with that child it, because it's not just the moment I mean when I'm judging it is the moment but when you're buying it's for a little longer term than just the moment it's over time and can they grow together that's the one thing that you have to look for and then one last question um, for the, again, for the Morgan Hunt Seat Junior Exhibitors, what are your favorite qualities in the hunter form? As an equitation rider? Um, it doesn't specify. I'm assuming they mean um, in the horse. Yeah, ek. Oh, ek, sorry. Okay, because when it said form, that's what I was thinking. Um, well, one of the things is their hands, their seat, um, at the different gates. Um, I don't want to see them too straight in the saddle, you know, when, um, when they're cantering. And it, it, I think the biggest thing I see is the hand position and the leg position. Um, some of the riders don't ride with the 30 degree angle um as the rules are and then their legs they can get a little bit more like a saddle seat rider instead of a hunter rider so and the horse's confirmation is going to dictate a little bit of that too but um i've seen a lot of uh hunter seat riders over the years and they're getting so much better today than they were say 10 years ago um where their legs were just from the knees down flared out and I'm like no they gotta have more contact than that um so I do look for that okay and that was our last question okay thank, thank you so much for doing this well thank you for having me it was a great honor very informational so having Thank you again for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you for doing this, Karen. We appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks.